Ready. In our lecture yesterday, we were talking about the fact that when we do stoichiometric calculations, that typically we're calculating what we call a theoretical amount of material that is produced or used up in a chemical reaction, indicating that everything does in fact undergo a reaction. In reality, many chemical reactions do not go to completion. By that we mean that all of the reactants we put in do not necessarily combine to form products. And the difference between then what we actually produce in a chemical process as compared to what we theoretically can produce in the process is what we call the percent yield. And of course then in order to calculate the percent yield of a chemical reaction, we need two pieces of information. We need to be able to determine the theoretical amount that we should get and we also have to know the measured quantity that we actually got. So we'll start by taking a look at <clears throat> another stoichiometric problem this morning. This one involving the reaction of hydrogen and nitrogen to form a chemical compound called ammonia. This is a very important industrial production because this is the starting step for the production of most commercial fertilizer. The ammonia that is produced in this step is converted into like ammonium nitrate, ammonium phosphate, uh, materials that are used then as fertilizers. The question here is, <clears throat> if we had started with a thousand grams or a kilogram of hydrogen, reacted it with sufficient nitrogen, so in other words, we have plenty of nitrogen around and this is the amount of hydrogen, and we found that we produced 4,550 grams or 4.55 kilograms of ammonia, what is the percent yield? What percent conversion did we get from hydrogen to the final product than ammonia? Well, this, of course, is what we refer to as the actual amount. And so what we need to calculate then is the theoretical amount and we're going to follow those same steps as we did in the previous lecture. I had some hands go up so I better stop here and answer a question. I, oh, uh, oh, oh, oh. Very good. All right. The question was, what about this three in front of my NH3? And that's good because you see this doesn't fit the law of conservation of atoms. And so if we looked at this, we would really have six hydrogens here. Therefore, this here should be two NH3s. All right. Very good to catch that. And that was actually then a mistake when I wrote it down. So we do need to have the correct balanced chemical equation we said in, in the lecture when we first started talking about stoichiometry. If we don't have the correct balanced equation, we're obviously not going to get the correct answer. So hopefully now we do have it properly balanced. The actual amount obtained was this, and so we're going to ask the question then, theoretically, how many grams of ammonia should we have been able to obtain? So we'll set this up then as grams of NH3, starting with 1,000 grams of hydrogen. And of course, the first step in the stoichiometric problem is to change from mass or whatever units to moles. And so we need to convert to moles of hydrogen then. One mole of hydrogen would be 2.02 grams of hydrogen. And so now the grams of hydrogen cancel out. And we then are ready to do the second step, which involves the ratio, the mole ratio from our balanced equation. 
And so looking at our equation, we say multiplied by two moles of ammonia per three moles of hydrogen. And so now we see that the moles of hydrogen have canceled and we're left with moles of ammonia. We're not quite done in this case because we have to go yet to third step. This is a, a, an example of a mass, mass stoichiometric problem. We have to convert from moles to grams. So multiplied by 17.04 grams of ammonia per one mole of ammonia. And of course that's the molar mass in other words, adding together the 14.01 from the nitrogen and 3.03 .03 from the three hydrogens. We're now ready to go ahead and determine then what our theoretical, this will be the theoretical amount, then we would have. So let's see, we would have uh, 1,000 divided by 2.02, multiplied by 2, divided by 3, and multiplied by 17.04. And we end up with 5.62 times 10 to the third grams theoretically that we could have produced. <coughs> Therefore, to calculate the percent yield, now, <coughs> one thing that we should note is that the theoretical had better come out larger than actual. I mean, we can't convert more than 100%. So if everything had reacted, then the most we could get would be this. So this number had better never be larger than our calculated theoretical amount. If it is, then we better go back and take a look because we possibly made a math error. We're now ready then to calculate the percent yield for this particular reaction. Percent yield we defined as then grams actual, 4.55 times 10 to the third grams, divided by the theoretical, 5.62 times 10 to the third grams, we see of course those cancel out, times 10 to the second. And so finishing up here then, Uh, we get an answer of 80.9 percent, three significant figures, 80.9 percent yield. Or in other words, only about 81 percent of the hydrogen actually ended up reacting. 20 percent of it still remained as hydrogen when the reaction was done. And this is typical of chemical reactions. Unless we form a solid that precipitates out or we form a gas that escapes, then most chemical reactions are not going to be 100% yield. Most of them are going to be less than that. And of course, as industrial chemists, they're quite interested in how can they improve the percent yield. And in a later chapter, we'll talk about factors that affect reaction rates and factors that affect what we call chemical equilibrium. And those are some things then that, that the scientists, the chemists can deal with to try to get greater percent yields then and of course make more money in the process. Any question on any step here? Now, <coughs> the problem could have been stated 1.000 kilograms and 4.55 kilograms. Had it been stated as such, we could of course convert from kilograms to grams and do it as we just did, or we can actually solve the problem using kilo units. If one mole of nitrogen reacts with three moles of hydrogen, then one kilomole 
of nitrogen reacts with three kilomoles. So we could keep everything in kilo units if we wanted to and get the same result. The thing is that we need to make sure that if we start with one in kilo units that everything is in kilo units in the problem. We won't go through all of the multiplication, but let me just show how we could set this up then. We would be saying kilograms of ammonia equals one kilogram of hydrogen multiplied by one kilomole of hydrogen per 2.02 kilograms. If I multiply the top by a thousand and the bottom by a thousand, I haven't changed a thing. And so this is the same as what we had previously. Now, of course, kilo units cancel. Multiplied by two kilomoles of ammonia per three kilomoles of hydrogen. And so the kilomoles would cancel there. And then finally multiplied by 17.04 kilograms of ammonia per one kilomole of ammonia. So if you run into a problem where things are stated in kilo units, you don't have to necessarily convert them to grams. You can go ahead and set up the entire problem and solve it in terms of kilo units. Well, let's take one more look at a percent yield type problem. This one a little different from the standpoint that it gives us the percent yield and then it asks us to solve for uh, the number of grams that we would actually get. So in other words, we can determine the theoretical and knowing the percent yield, calculate the actual amount. If we think of for a second here, again, percent yield equals grams actual over grams theoretical times 10 to the second. In this problem, we know how many, uh, or we know the percent yield, so we already have this number. From our stoichiometric setup, we can calculate the grams theoretical, and of course, knowing that piece of information and this piece of information determine the number of grams actual. And so that's what the problem is saying. How many grams of carbon dioxide could we get from this reaction if it actually only yielded 89.3 percent? Well, so our first step is going to be then to determine the theoretical. Now, up till now, I've been setting these up in a, a continuous fashion. In other words, we just keep going conversion factor after conversion factor to cancel out. If you're uncomfortable doing it in that fashion, we can do it stepwise. And I'm going to do this one stepwise then, just to give you an alternate way. In other words, what I'm going to ask in the very first, this is 50 grams of the compound. That's my starting material. So the first question I'm going to ask, step number one, is I'm going to say how many moles of the known substance, which in this particular case is CH3OH, how many moles of the known substance do I have? And I would start with 50.0 grams of CH3OH and multiply by one mole of CH3OH per number of grams. And we would have to determine that, so we'd have to calculate that. Well, let's see. Uh, we would have one carbon, so that would be 12.01, and four hydrogens would be 4.04 .04 added to that, so that would give us 16.05. And then one oxygen weighs 16, so 16.05 and 16 would give us 32.05 grams. Now, we will actually calculate that number. So I'm going to say 50 divided by 32.05, and I'll put down my answer, 
five, six moles of CH3OH. That was step number one in our roadmap. Step number two says, how many moles of the unknown substance do we have? And then, of course, we rely on this first step plus our balanced equation. And so step number two, we're asking how many moles of CO2 would we produce? Well, we know that we have 1.56 moles of CH3OH. And then we look to our balanced chemical equation and we see that the ratio between carbon dioxide and the known substance, which is uh, methyl alcohol or wood alcohol, is two to two. So we have two moles of CO2 per two moles of CH3OH. Moles of that cancel. And, of course, our answer at this point is now 1.56 moles of CO2. Well, we didn't ask for moles of CO2. We had to determine, based on our percent yield, we have to come up with the grams of CO2. So step number three, we're going to convert to grams of carbon dioxide. So grams of carbon dioxide is 1.56 mole of CO2 multiplied by, calculating the weight, 12 plus the 32, 44.01 gram of carbon dioxide per one mole. And that unit cancels and now we're at grams of carbon dioxide, which is, in this case, the theoretical amount. In other words, that's how many grams of carbon dioxide we get if all 50 grams of the wood alcohol reacts. Well, let's see. So we have 1.56 times 44.01 and we would end up then with 68.7 grams of CO2. Now, one thing I should mention that if you do it stepwise, and take the answer off the calculator and write it down, you might get a slightly different answer than you do if you put it all in one continuous fashion and do your significant figures at the end. That's not anything to be concerned. If your answer, when you calculate something, is only off by a tenth, or if, if we're in, in the hundredth places, a couple of hundredths different than the answer given, that's nothing to be concerned. That's merely the way one carries it on the calculator frequently. All right, so if you came up with 68.6 because you had taken this number and this number and that without keeping it on the calculator, you might get 68.6 or you might get 68.8. That's nothing to be concerned about. Now, the final step of the problem, however, is what was to calculate the grams actual, not the grams theoretical. So the grams actual would be equal to 68.7 grams of CO2 multiplied by 89.3% divided by 100. And so we would end up then multiplying by 0.893. And we would actually get out 61.3 grams of carbon dioxide. So theoretically, we should get out 68.7. But if the process is only 89 point, uh, whatever it was, 89.3 percent uh, effective, then we're only going to actually produce the 61.3 grams. Any question on this idea of using percent yield in our calculations? All right. Another factor involved in calculating and in, in the way that we would really do chemical reactions deals with a topic that we call limiting reactant. In other words, when we carry out a chemical process in the lab, 
we do not try to measure out exactly the correct amount of each of the reactants. Because typically, one of the reactants will probably be rather expensive, and one of the reactants will be rather inexpensive. So we want to make sure that we use up as much of the expensive reactant as we can. And so we'll probably put in a whole bunch extra of the inexpensive one. We don't try to weigh out each one exactly correctly. And the amount of product that we produce then is going to depend upon which of the chemicals we're putting in is used up first. Once one of the chemicals is used up, the reaction has to obviously stop. There's nothing there to carry out the reaction. And the chemical that is used up first in the chemical reaction is referred to as the limiting reactant. Or sometimes we call it the limiting reagent. Now, we might think about it in terms of, let's suppose that we were running a, a small bicycle manufacturing plant in our, our, our garage or something. So we're manufacturing bicycles. And I come in this morning and I check my inventory of parts that I have around in there to uh, build bicycles. And when I scan through, I find that I have uh, five frames. Well, obviously we should be, be able to build how many bicycles based on five frames? Well, five, right? If we have all the rest of the necessary parts, we could build five bicycles today. Well, I have seven handlebars. Well, I've got enough handlebars to build seven bicycles, I mean five bicycles. I've got enough handlebars to build seven, but I only have five frames, so I'm still limited to building five bicycles in the process. Unless you want a bicycle without a handlebar. Or I've got eight seats sitting on the shelf. And again, I could build eight bicycles based on the number of seats, but I can only build five bicycles built built based on the number of frames. I have six sprocket sets. Again, I could theoretically build six bicycles based on the sprocket sets, but I only have five frames, so I'm still limited to building five bicycles that day. And the last inventory I look at, I have nine wheels. How many bicycles can I complete today? How many? Four. I can only build four bicycles today. The limiting factor, the limiting reactant in this case, would be the number of wheels. When I've used up eight of the nine wheels, I'm done for the day. Now, unless I want to build a unicycle. But that wasn't the question. The question was how many bicycles could we build? And so our productivity today is dependent upon this. And so this would be our limiting factor, we'll call it. In this case, it's not a chemical. That would be the limiting factor to the production of the final product, the bicycle. And so that's what we're looking at in stoichiometric problems when we just mix different amounts of chemicals together and ask how much product we're going to get. To determine how much product we're going to get, we need to know which of the chemicals is the limiting chemical in the process, which we do call then the limiting reactant. Well, let's look at a couple of example problems of that type. <clears throat> Here we have a reaction that we saw earlier, which was the reaction between hydrogen and nitrogen to produce ammonia. And, and uh, notice that here I don't have this one balanced either. And so we need to have things balanced before we can do the stoichiometry. To complete the balance, of course, we need a 2 in front of the NH3. All right. 
Now this is what we're going to do. We're going to put together 15 grams of hydrogen and we're going to put in 55 grams of nitrogen. The question is, how many grams of ammonia am I going to produce? Just like how many bicycles could I produce with the inventory I had. If I put this inventory of hydrogen and this inventory of nitrogen, how many grams of ammonia am I going to be able to produce? Now we're assuming here that everything will react that can react. And so to determine how many grams of ammonia we're going to produce, we're going to have to determine which one of these is the limiting reactant. Which one is going to be used up first? Now there's several ways that one could attack the problem. You could start here with 15 grams and say how many grams of nitrogen do I really need? If I needed more than 55, then it would tell me the nitrogen was going to run out first. If I needed less than 55, it would tell me the hydrogen would run out first. Or, seeing that we need to know how many grams of ammonia we're going to produce anyway, probably the way to go would be to ask two questions. How many grams of ammonia can I produce based on hydrogen? And then how many grams of ammonia can I produce based on the nitrogen? The actual number of grams we can produce will be the smallest of those two calculated values. And once we know which one gives us the smallest amount, that identifies the limiting reactant. So what we're going to do is two stoichiometric calculations here then. And the first one we're going to ask then grams of ammonia based on hydrogen. That will be our first setup. So let's go ahead and do that. We had 15 grams of hydrogen and the first thing we're going to do is convert that to moles. So one mole of hydrogen per 2.02 grams. So those units cancel. And now we're going to find out how many moles of ammonia, so two moles of ammonia per three moles of hydrogen. And so that has canceled out. And we're going to finally convert to grams, so 17.04 grams of ammonia per one mole of ammonia. And that unit cancels out and we would determine a numeric value for that. Well, let's go ahead then and quickly do that one. So we have 15 divided by 2.02, multiplied by 2 divided by 3, and multiplied by 17.04, and we get 84.4 grams of ammonia produced. That's based on the hydrogen. We'll now ask the same question, except this time we'll say how many grams do we have based on the based on the um, nitrogen. So we're going to start then with 55.0 grams of nitrogen multiplied by one mole of nitrogen per 28.02 grams of nitrogen. So we're at moles. Now we use our balanced equation multiplied by two moles of ammonia per one mole of nitrogen. And so that will cancel. And now converting from moles to grams, 17.04 grams of ammonia per one mole of ammonia. Keep in mind again that as we plug in these conversion factors, we're always working so that our units on the right hand side become the units we ask for on the left. We wanted grams of ammonia, that's what we have left for units now, and so the problem should be, again, correctly set up. So, working this one out, we have 55 divided by 28.02, multiplied by 2, and multiplied by 17.04, 
and we have an answer of 66.9 grams of ammonia. All right, based on our two calculations, as we looked at the bicycle production, based on our calculation, how many grams of ammonia can I actually produce when I put 15 grams and 55 grams together? Which one is the amount that I will actually produce? The 66.9. Once we have produced 66.9 grams of ammonia, all of the nitrogen has been used up. I no longer have any nitrogen to react with the additional hydrogen that is there. I will have hydrogen left over when I get done, but the nitrogen will have all been used up. And at that point, of course, our reaction will have stopped. And so we have calculated the amount that we're actually going to produce. And based on that, the limiting reactant then is the nitrogen in this particular problem. So as I said, there are several ways one can approach the problem. But if, in fact, you have to ultimately determine the number of grams of a product anyway, the easiest is probably to go ahead and set up two stoichiometric setups for each of the two reactants involved. And from that, you can not only determine what the limiting reactant is, but you can also determine, of course, the actual answer to the problem, the number of grams of product formed. Well, let's look at one more example of that. <coughs> Here we have, again, a reaction of a hydrocarbon, propane, which we have uh, mentioned a couple of other times. And we have propane reacting with oxygen to give us carbon dioxide and water. And the question in this problem is, that is a good question. What is the question in the problem? Because I didn't manage to write everything down that I needed here, so we will need to get us a piece of information. And it says, identify the limiting reactant and determine how many grams of carbon dioxide are produced. So the question is grams of CO2 produced. And we have the two materials there. Now, in this particular case, what I thought I would do, rather than, again, setting it all up in one continuous fashion, I'm going to go ahead and calculate, then, the grams of CO2 based on CH, C3H8. But I'm going to do it in step fashion, rather than as one continuous setup just to again show you that you can use that alternate method if you prefer. So step number one, I'm going to determine the number of moles of C3H8. And that's going to be equal to 30.0 grams times one mole per number of grams. And for C3H8, it'd be three times 12, 36.03 plus eight 0.08, so that would be 44.11 grams. And so that'll cancel. And let's see, we would have a number at that point, 30 divided by 44.11. We have 0 0.680 moles of C3H8. The second step, then, is to determine the moles of CO2 produced, and that will be equal to 0 0.680 moles of the C3H8 multiplied by our ratio here, 3 moles of CO2 per 1 mole of C3H8. And so multiplying now by 3, we would end up with 
four moles of CO2. And the third step then would be to determine the number of grams of CO2, which would be equal to 2.04 moles of CO2 multiplied by 44.01 grams per one mole. And we would end up with then an answer of 89.8 grams of CO2. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the other part I'm going to go ahead and set up as one continuous one rather than do it in three parts. But I'm just doing this to show you there is more than one way to, to take yourself through a stoichiometric problem. And if doing it in individual steps rather than trying to do it in one continuous fashion is more comfortable, then certainly that's the method you should use. The other one now we're going to calculate the grams of CO2 based on uh, the oxygen, O2. And I guess I'll use a little different color here just so that we can keep them separated. So, grams of CO2 would be equal to 140.0 grams of oxygen. That's the other reactant we had. Multiplied by one mole of oxygen per 32.00 grams, so our grams of oxygen cancel, multiplied by three moles of CO2 per, okay, we have to go back here and look, and our ratio this time is three to five, so three moles of carbon dioxide per five moles of oxygen times 44.01 grams of carbon dioxide per one mole of carbon dioxide. And working that out then, we have 140 divided by 32, multiplied by three, divided by five, and multiplied by 44.01. And we end up with an answer of 116 grams of CO2. Two. So, looking at the two calculated values here for the problem, looking at our two calculated values, this one and this one, then how many grams of CO2 can we in fact produce? 89 0.8. Once we have produced 89.8 grams of carbon dioxide, then the propane, the C3H8, has been used up. And the reaction obviously can go no further. And so the final question was, what is the limiting reactant in this particular problem? And so the limiting reactant is the C3H8. Eight. All right. Any any question on this idea of limiting reactants? In chapter one, we talked about chemistry as the study of matter and the changes that it undergoes. And we also indicated that for chemical change to occur or a physical change to occur, they usually involve energy. And so the last part of this chapter takes a look at how energy is related to chemical change. We categorize the energy in two different ways. We call chemical reactions either endothermic or exothermic. These are the two categories. Now, the prefix exo is one that you're probably somewhat familiar with. When we see the sign exit, it means to go out from. 
Exo then is a process of moving away from something. So when we talk about exothermic, we're talking about thermal energy, that means heat energy, heat energy coming out. That's what exothermic means. Endo is the prefix that we use to say into, if we're putting something into, or if we're talking about an underlying layer of tissue, for instance, that's an endoplasm or an endostructure. A shell or our skin is an exo, outside layer of an object. Okay, so endo means in, and endothermic then means energy in, heat energy being put into the chemical process. Now, the reactions that typically fall into the category endothermic are those that we call decomposition reactions. We take a compound and we put energy in and we tear it apart. We're decomposing it into its individual other units or we're decomposing it into some other compounds in the process. And an example of this is if we were to take liquid water, for instance, and provide it with sufficient energy, we can decompose the water into the two elements, hydrogen and oxygen. This chemical process is called endothermic because we have to put energy into it in order to get the chemical change to occur. Water does not spontaneously fall apart into hydrogen and oxygen. It requires an input of energy for that to occur. The other type, the exothermic processes, are those when chemicals are combining usually and especially the processes of oxygen combining with materials are usually exothermic. Heat energy is given off. As a matter of fact, of course, that's what we do with the hydrocarbons. Here's the simple hydrocarbon we've talked about previously, methane, the major component of natural gas. When a, uh, <coughs> a furnace or a gas stove, which is new using natural gas, is is uh, working, it is combining then the methane with the oxygen in the atmosphere to produce carbon dioxide and water and give off energy. And it's that energy, of course, that we use to heat our home or to heat the water in a pot on the stove, whatever the case might be. It's that exothermic process, that exothermic chemical change that we're taking use of. Now, in chemistry, the basic unit of energy is the joule. And the joule is defined in your text, but that's not, that's not even important to us, what the joule is defined as. The joule is the unit of heat energy that we will deal with. Now, a couple of other units of energy that you may have heard about, and let's relate to the joule then, are the calorie with a little c and the calorie with a large c. The calorie with a large c is the calorie that we typically think about when we're relating to food. So if we say that, that we have burned up 2,000 calories of energy, then that means that we have burned up 2,000 food calories of energy. <coughs> And actually, the food calorie, the, the capital C here, is actually 1,000 calories. That's what a food calorie is. Or in other words, another way of stating it is it's equal to one kilocalorie, 1,000 calories with the small c, all right? Now, what is this small c? Well, this small c is the amount of energy required, the amount of thermal or heat energy required to heat one gram of water one Celsius degree. That's what a calorie is. 
a food calorie then is a thousand of those or in other words it would be enough energy to heat one gram of water a thousand degrees which we can't do or to heat a thousand grams of water one degree or in other words a food calorie would be enough to heat a thousand grams of water one Celsius degree and a thousand grams of water would be about 2.2 pounds so one food calorie would heat up 2.2 pounds of water one Celsius degree so 20 calories 20 food calories would be enough to heat up 2.2 pounds of water 20 Celsius degrees so food calorie really is a lot of energy and when we think that we typically burn two to three thousand food calories a day in our biological process we see that a lot of energy is involved in the biochemical process that keeps us alive now the jewel here is smaller than the calorie as a matter of fact there are 4.184 joules per one calorie so a joule is about one-fourth of a calorie then so it's a fairly small energy unit all right and our problems in chemistry we're going to be using the unit joule and we will be also using of course kilojoule because the joule is such a small amount that typically most energies of reactions are stated in kilojoules rather than in joules let me just quickly mention one other unit here that is an English unit and we won't be encountering it but it's the BTU and this is certainly something you hear about if you buy an air conditioner or if you buy a furnace for a home it's the amount of heat output the BTU stands for the British thermal unit and the British thermal unit is the amount of energy needed to heat one pound of water one Fahrenheit degree that's a British thermal unit and as I say we won't use it any further than other than just to mention it but that's the way then that heaters that furnaces that air conditioners etc are rated is in units of BTUs indicating the amount of energy that they would give off per unit of time actually it's British thermal unit per hour so 40,000 BTU unit would mean that it can give off or extract 40,000 British thermal units per one hour in our next lecture then we'll take a look at how this energy can be quantitatively tied into stoichiometric problems